Welcome to Food for Thought. My name is Colleen Patrick Goudreau from Compassionate Cooks. I founded Compassionate Cooks to empower people to make informed food choices and to debunk myths about vegetarianism and animal rights. You can learn more about who we are and what we do by visiting our websites, www.compassionatecooks.com and www.joyofveganbaking.com. I don't know why, but it feels like it's been a long time since I've recorded an episode, even though it's not. It was like a week ago. So anyway, hi, everybody. I hope you're all doing well. I'm very excited to announce that Veg News Magazine named my new cookbook, The Joy of Vegan Baking, Cookbook of the Year, which is pretty awesome. And I just wanted to let you know, I really appreciate the response the book has been getting. And I really appreciate all of you who've posted reviews on Amazon and on your blogs. And I encourage you to keep spreading the word. Word of mouth is a very powerful thing. And it's one of the best ways to help spread the word and to let everybody else know about the book. So thank you for doing so. And I'm really very honored. There are a lot of fantastic cookbooks out there. And I'm very honored that Veg News named our cookbook my cookbook, a cookbook of the year. First of all, today's podcast sponsor wanted to remain anonymous, but he requested this topic many, many months ago. So even though I did tackle uh, Thanksgiving in a previous episode, I wrote it knowing that I would be writing one specifically on Thanksgiving menus, on what to eat, on what to serve, etc. So Mr. Anonymous Sponsor, you know who you are, and I know who you are, and I thank you for your sponsorship and for your topic request because I think it's a really good one, and I think it will hopefully help a number of people interested in leaving turkeys off their holiday menu this year and hopefully for many years to follow. I am tempted, I'm so tempted to read emails from so many people who are podcast listeners and, and supporters, and I just don't feel like I have the time. We have a lot to cover in this episode, but I just want to thank all of you who take the time to write me emails. I cannot tell you how much they mean to me and how moving they are, and I promise I will read them because I... I I don't think they're just for me. I really think they're for other people to hear so that they can find things they can relate to and and just hear about how many incredible people there are out there, you know, experiencing their own transformations. And, and, and I just want you to know that your compassionate thoughts and your compassionate actions do create a ripple effect all around you. Don't doubt it for a second. So thank you so much for your emails. They're really, they're really incredible. And thank you so much to the one-time sponsors and the monthly sponsors. I'm so grateful for your support. If you are willing and able to support this podcast, I encourage you to visit www.compassionatecooks.com and click on support this podcast on behalf of the turkeys and all the other anonymous victims of our appetites. I thank you. So in a recent episode... I talked about celebrating the rituals of such holidays as Halloween and Thanksgiving without compromising your values, and I promised I would elaborate on Thanksgiving in particular. If you haven't listened to that episode yet, I would recommend it because there's some really fun and interesting information about the first Thanksgiving which wouldn't have been called Thanksgiving back in 1621. I mentioned in that episode a woman named Sarah Josepha Hale, and I want to talk a little bit about her before I get into some nitty-gritty details about Thanksgiving menus. Hale, who lived a long life from 1788 to 1879, was quite an interesting and determined American woman who was involved in many causes. She was a prolific writer and editor, She was a champion of women's rights. She was a promoter of child welfare and a fundraiser for civic causes. But she's perhaps most known as the author of the popular nursery rhyme, Mary Had a Little Lamb. As early as 1827, Hale, who had become editor of a popular magazine, began calling for a national celebration of Thanksgiving. She wrote, We have too few holidays. Thanksgiving, like the 4th of July, should be considered a national festival and be observed by all our people. And so she began a 40-year 
quest for 40 years. She wrote to congressmen. She lobbied five presidents, including Polk, uh, Taylor, Fillmore, Pierce, Buchanan, and finally Lincoln. And she wrote countless editorials in her campaign to create an official day of thanks. Now, if you remember from the previous podcast episode on, on Thanksgiving and Halloween, our knowledge of the first Thanksgiving comes from two sources. One, a letter dated December 1621 by Edward Winslow, and two, a book written by William Bradford 20 years after the actual event. And that book was stolen by looters during the Revolutionary War, and so it didn't even reappear until 1854. One of the things Bradford says in his book is that the colonists killed wild turkeys during the autumn season. That's all he wrote about turkeys. It has nothing to do with thanks it had nothing to do with Thanksgiving per se. And this is what Sarah Josepha Hale latched onto when she began popularizing and mythologizing this holiday. In her magazine, she began writing romantic accounts of the first Thanksgiving, taking liberties to appeal to her readership and including recipes for roasted turkeys, for stuffing, and for pumpkin pies, all of the things that today's holiday meals are likely to contain, and none of the things that would have actually been on the table of the first Thanksgiving. As a result, she created holiday traditions that share few similarities with the original feast in 1621. Now, as I said in the last episode, I don't care what was on the table of the first feast, because clearly, as you can see, it doesn't matter. We take from it what we want. We took from it what we want. Sarah Josepha Hale certainly took from it what she wanted. And we create our myths and traditions from dubious sources that give us what we want not what was exact, not anything that reflects fact or, or documented history. And that obviously means less to us than the traditions we create. We're not as interested in creating an exact replica of the first Thanksgiving as we are in having customs and traditions that we can point to so that we feel connected to something bigger and older than ourselves. That's why it's just as traditional not to have dead turkeys on the table as it is to have dead turkeys on the table at Thanksgiving. We shape our traditions out of our ideals. And Sarah Josepha Hale selectively chose what to include on her menu, and we can do the same. When she contrived a romantic ideal of the first Thanksgiving, it caught on, and it became a big popular subject for prints and books and paintings, all of which continue to shape our notion of what it was like in 1621. Though Hale's depictions were wrong more than they were right, they stuck. So once again, in 1858, again, Bradford's book was found in 1854. In 1858, Hale petitioned the president of the United States, at this time it was Lincoln, to declare Thanksgiving a national holiday. Five years later, on October 3rd, 1863, while the country was suffering the ravages of the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln declared the last Thursday of November as a day of Thanksgiving. And though Hale definitely did turkeys a great injustice by putting their carcasses in the center of our tables, she did have some really generous notions about what she saw this holiday representing, and I thought I would share that with you. Unfortunately, these traditions didn't really get carried on with the same tenacity as the turkey tradition, but maybe we can change that. She envisioned this holiday being about charity and generosity and, of course, giving thanks. She wrote, quote, let us consecrate the day to benevolence of action by sending good gifts to the poor and doing those deeds of charity that will for one day make every American home the place of plenty and of rejoicing. As early as 1827, she suggested, so back when she first started petitioning people to to make this a national holiday, she suggested that 40,000 churches accept donations on a day of Thanksgiving and use the funds to free the slaves so that all of America could truly be free. So you can see that her intentions really were very, very benevolent for this holiday, though it took 40 years, nearly 40 years to make this happen. And though this aspect of the holiday does seem to be lost amidst the killing of the turkeys and the watching of the football, she got her wish. She is a stellar example of what one person can accomplish if she puts her mind to it and carries out the steps necessary. She had a vision and she did not let go of it. It's quite a lesson to be taken from from that. 
Before Hale's mythologizing of that first Thanksgiving, it was quite a different scene. Until the early 1800s, Thanksgiving was considered to be a simple regional holiday that was celebrated solemnly through fasting and quiet reflection, quite a bit different from how we celebrate today. As you can see by now, over the centuries, the first Thanksgiving took on a shape of mythological proportions, but how Americans celebrate today really has very little to do with the original intention and meaning of that first cultural convergence. What we do know for certain about the first Thanksgiving is that, one, it was a harvest celebration in 1621 that lasted for three days. Two, the feast most likely occurred between September 21st and November 11th. That's when the harvest would have been brought in. Uh, three, approximately 90 Wampanoag Indians and 52 colonists, the latter mostly women and children, participated. Four, cranberry sauce, potatoes, white or sweet, and pies were not on the menu, and forks were not used then, so the celebrants ate with their hands. And five, besides meals, the event also included recreation and entertainment. And even as the myths started by Sarah Hale began to permeate the culture's consciousness, turkey was still not widely accepted as the quintessential Thanksgiving dish until the mid-20th century. I think I talked about this a bit in my Talking Turkeys podcast episode, but wild turkeys who we bred our domestic turkeys from were dark feathered and thus dark skinned. And this began to be unappetizing to people. And it still is, including to the housewives who had to remove the tiny pin feathers from the dark skinned carcass. So to make the affair less arduous and more appealing to consumers, the Beltsville white turkey was bred and perfected in 1947. The Beltsville white was the culmination of a breeding program launched by the USDA at the behest of the National Turkey Federation to produce a bird with a more aesthetically pleasing carcass. Also, in 1947, began the National Turkey Federation's annual presentation of a turkey to the standing U.S. president. Coupled with the introduction of the new light-skinned Beltsville white, turkey consumption in the U.S. took off from there. Between 1950 and 1960, turkey consumption doubled at the very least, and consumption has continued to rise every year after that, peaking in 1994 at around 18 pounds of turkey per person. Check out the Talking Turkey podcast episode for more about how fabulous turkeys are alive and how much they suffer at the hands of humans. So it's about time we start changing things, don't you think? And we can do this by preparing a feast that will delight the senses and open our hearts. First of all, I am always amazed, truly, I am amazed when people say, so what, what do you eat for Thanksgiving? And I think on some level, people know the answer to this, because if they took just a second to think about what they eat for Thanksgiving, they'll see that it's really all the same food with just a few tweaks. So let's talk about the main dish first. Now, I may have said this before, so please forgive me if I'm repeating myself, but the way we construct our plates, the way we create our meals is based on what we have been taught within our culture and within our families. There isn't some like meal god in the sky determining how we should eat and how we should plate our food. It's all taught. And I think one of the reasons people think vegans and vegetarians eat only side dishes or salads is because we've all been taught from day one that meat is the centerpiece of the meal. This isn't a cultural construct as much as it is a Western cultural construct in general and an American construct in particular. And we, Americans, American society, American culture have definitely influenced other cultures around the world to start eating as we do. But if you look at cultures all around the world, meat is not or was not the center of their plate. So when people in our Western culture think of a plate without meat, they think of a plate with a big empty space where the meat should be and then just some token, some token side dishes because that's what their experience has been. And this is why I say that changing our diet, changing from an animal-based to a plant-based diet, Diet is as much about changing the way we think about food as it is changing the way we actually eat. On one hand, it's okay. You have permission to eat only what we call side dishes. They're the best dishes anyway, the vegetables and grains and lentils and beans and salads. One of my favorite cuisines is Ethiopian. And if you've never tried Ethiopian cuisine, please 
try to find an Ethiopian restaurant near you and, and go try their vegetarian platter. It's just so beautiful and so flavorful and healthful. When you get the vegetarian platter, you get a gorgeous platter of the most colorful foods or yellow lentils and sauteed greens and red lentils. And they're all flavored so, so wonderfully. And it's a beautiful presentation. So on one hand, let's rethink uh, what a plate of food should actually look like and embrace the notion of having a plate of what we would call side dishes, okay? But if you want the experience of a main dish, of a centerpiece, then that's easy, 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 easy to do on an everyday basis or for our purposes here for Thanksgiving or any other fancy schmancy holiday meal or any other fancy schmancy meal. It doesn't have to be just for the holidays. Now, if you think about it, I have thought about it and I think we have a very odd reaction to the Thanksgiving turkey. It's quite a grotesque scene. This defeathered, beheaded bird lying helpless and dead on this plate with his legs tied together and his insides disemboweled only to be replaced with bread. It's, I don't know, it's kind of grotesque and perverse. And, and yet many people ooh and ah at this lifeless animal on the silver platter at the center of the table. And what I have learned in my many years of observing people is that it's not the turkey people are so attached to, as much as they are attached to having a centerpiece, having a focus on the plate, having a a focus on the table. And this can be accomplished in many ways, obviously much better ways, more compassionate ways, and more healthful ways too. So there's the obvious trade-off of a dead turkey for like a tofu roast. But there was only one year that we did this, and we did this many years ago, and we haven't had the desire to do it since. It's just because we want fresh vegetables and grains, and and we didn't really need something that resembled um, a turkey. And by that time, of course now, we had already shifted our thinking about what our plate and dinner table should look like. So we just didn't need that experience of having that kind of familiar thing on our plate. But for those of you who, who like the novelty of it, it's fine. Um, there are a few options out there, and they really have improved tremendously over the years. The one that's been around the longest and that's also organic is called Tofurky. It's made by Turtle Island Foods and the website is www.tofurky.com. T-O-F-U, tofu, R-K-Y.com. And I've said a number of times that I advocate a whole foods plant-based diet as the foundation of our diet, but that doesn't mean I don't ever eat processed foods once in a while. Mostly I just eat them as a novelty um, or a special occasion or something. But I have to say that as far as quote unquote processed foods go, I'm really impressed with Turtle Island's foods methods and their ingredients. For instance, their sausage, tofurkey sausage, their Italian sausage is amazing. It's so delicious. It's not low in fat just to let you know, it's definitely a food that I consider a rich food. And again, it would be a special occasion food, but the ingredients are all familiar. The first ingredient is tofu. And then there's wheat gluten. Wheat gluten is just the protein in wheat. And then the rest of the ingredients are the seasonings. There's no isolated soy protein in their sausages. And the isolated soy protein is what has some people complaining about the concerns about soy because it's very concentrated soy and it's showing up in all sorts of things these days. But Tofurky's foods don't include this. They're made from tofu and they're non-GMO soybeans also. And same goes for their to- their Tofurky their tofurkey roast. So that's just one option as a centerpiece, you know, as kind of the main dish. Another idea is field roast, www.fieldroast.com. And you, again, you'll find this in the tofurkey in larger natural food stores. And there is a store locator on the website of field roast, probably on tofurkey's website too. They make some delicious foods. And again, they're from whole foods, not processed and, and concentrated ingredients. They're also a bit high on the fat side. So again, it's kind of a rich special occasion food. And even though it's not the harmful animal-based saturated fat, and of course you should know by now that there's no cholesterol in these plant foods because there's no cholesterol in plant foods, I still look at these foods as kind of a novelty uh, special occasion food, not foundational foods. But Field Roast really makes some really wonderful, delicious foods, such as their Celebration Roast, which is a wheat gluten-based loaf stuffed with a sausage-style stuffing, which is made from butternut squash and apples and mushrooms. They have thin-sliced Field Roast, Field Roast cutlets. And again, all of these are made from wheat and mushrooms rather than with soy. They also have deli slices and gravy and pate and meatloaf, etc. So check out their website, Field Roast. And you can find some other things, find some ideas there. 
And look, I think these are good transition foods for for non-vegetarians. As again, I can't emphasize enough. I kind of see them as special occasion foods because I really want the foundation of of our diets to return to whole foods. But again, we're talking about a special occasion here. Um, and I've noticed over the years that roasts such as the tofurkey and the celebration field roast, they don't attempt to to shape themselves in the form of a dead turkey. I remember years ago there were turkeys that kind of even came with legs, you know, like soy based legs and you know it's kind of nice that they don't try to look like a turkey but frankly i think there's something to it even though the idea of, of forming plant foods into the shape of a dead animal seems odd to some people it really is a powerful symbol if you think about it having something look and taste familiar is very powerful for many people so as much as i've heard non-vegetarians mock that idea like that person in that article uh, they're the first to scoff at the idea of having their own familiar beloved symbols altered even the idea of a hot dog is more powerful than the hot dog itself people grew up with it and so it's just the kind of familiar thing of that long thing in a bun and truthfully they could care less if it actually came from the intestines of a pig they would be just as satisfied with the experience of the hot dog rather than the than the you know than the flesh of the animal so don't underestimate the power of the symbolism of of traditional things the power of the symbol of of something like turkey and that's what i think that it's all about it goes deeper than the actual turkey so if you can replace that with something that could be as powerful and, and tangible and meaningful for people, that's, to me, what the bottom line is. That's what it comes down to. So let's talk about some other centerpieces, because creating a plate can be like creating art, especially when you rely on the beautiful colors that exist only in plant foods. When you look at a vegan spread, a vegan table, the first thing you notice is, is all the gorgeous color. Now, I tend to do a different centerpiece, a different main dish every year, but my favorite is probably a stuffing, is probably a stuffing some kind of pumpkin squash, particularly acorn squash, because they're so gorgeous. And so you can use whatever filling you want, but I like putting the filling in an acorn squash that everybody gets at their on their plate. Now, David and I, we host every year, every Thanksgiving. And though we tend to have the same like, core 10 people or so, sometimes they bring friends or, or family members who are visiting from out of town. Sometimes we have 20 people. Sometimes we have 15 people. It really varies. But we have celebrated Thanksgiving with our good friends, John and Randy, for almost as many years as we've been in California, which is going on 10 years in 2008. So it's a very special day for us. And every Everybody cooks something. Once we get a head count, we create the menu. And again, we have kind of the same core things every year, but because we have new people coming and going every year, we're, we're blessed with new and delicious goodies that, that we didn't expect. And we've had some amazing, amazing dishes made by friends of friends. But this kind of potluck situation always works really well because even though there's work involved with hosting, it's not like I'm in charge of making an entire menu for, for 10 or 15 or 20 people. So our menu varies a bit from year to year, but but I'm always in charge of the main dish. And of course, the vegan thing isn't an issue at all. Um, frankly, most of our friends are vegan, um, but even if they invite their non-vegan friends or, or family, it's just a given that this is a vegan dinner. So everyone just steps up and makes fabulous dishes that they realized were vegan anyway, or they just didn't call it vegan. So they might make one slight change, like using earth balance instead of dairy-based butter or olive oil, you know, instead of dairy-based butter. Um, but that's, that's really all the changes they make. So if you do host, don't be afraid to ask for what honors your values and your home. You call the shots. It's your life. It's your set of values. It's your home, especially if you're hosting. Raise the bar. I have found that when you raise the bar, people never fail to rise to it. That's been my experience, at least. So as far as what I make for the main dish, pretty much what I'm making in my cooking class for that Thanksgiving class is what my main dish tends to be. A couple of years in a row, we did the acorn squash. I have a harvest stuffed acorn squash, which can be found in my recipe packet Thanksgiving one. And it's also what I demonstrate on the cooking DVD. It's just gorgeous. You can stuff the acorn squash with whatever you want, but the one that... I make, and, and that's in that recipe pack, it tends to be a combination of brown and white rice, toasted pecans or chestnuts, uh, celery, cranberries, onions, the squash flesh itself, 
and a lot of wintry spices such as cardamom and cloves and cinnamon, etc. It's a really beautiful presentation and it really does elicit that same visceral reaction from people when they see that, that beautiful squash on each person's plate. It's just lovely. Another year I made a pilaf, which you can find in Thanksgiving packet two, which was a, a curried apricot pilaf. And you can either put this in individual squashes and then on, you know, or pumpkins on, on people's plates. Or what I did one year was I hollowed out a couple medium sized sugar pumpkins and I put them on the table with a hot pilaf inside and people just serve themselves from the from the pumpkins and it makes again a beautiful presentation you can do the same thing with soup you can hollow out the pumpkins and serve soup from the pumpkins right on the table one year i made what i call autumn tempeh salad with butternut squash and sage and that is in the recipe packet tofu and tempeh too but it's also in thanksgiving too and in there i think it's called autumn tempeh medley and it's just absolutely delicious and it's really simple Another year, I think it was last year, I made these really adorable butternut squash and rice timbales with sautéed kale. So a timbale basically comes from the word drum. It's basically a drum-shaped mold. That's where it gets the name. And so I made the rice and butternut squash and herb combo, and then I put it in little ramekins. You know, the little ramekins? Um, you can use whatever bowls or size or shape you have, and then you basically unmold it directly on the plate. And so it's in this little mold, this little round mold. You get it, right? Okay. So, and then at that point, you can just sprinkle it with some fresh herbs or toasted nuts or something like that. And again, it's really pretty. This year, I'm going to make a harvest stuffed phyllo uh, triangle, phyllo triangles. And that's what I'm teaching in my Thanksgiving class this year. And I'll try to get those recipes up soon and this the phyllo is just delicious i know a lot of people are intimidated by phyllo it do not be intimidated by working with phyllo dough you get this in the grocery store it's usually in the frozen section you defrost it put it in your refrigerator and then you have these wonderful thin sheets that you just brush with olive oil or or non-dairy butter and and you whatever you want to put in it, either savory or sweet filling and then you know it's that wonderful crispy light um dough. It's just fantastic. And there's actually two strudel recipes in my cookbook. And I talk at length about working with phyllo there. There's apple strudel and a black forest strudel, which is chocolate and cherry. So anyway, please don't be afraid of working with phyllo. It's so forgiving and it's really so simple. And you look really fancy schmancy when you, when you, when you make something with it. Other main dishes can be whatever you want them to be. You can marinate and season tofu slices. You can um, serve the caramelized tempeh I've told you about in the five favorite foods episode. You can make a, an Italian Thanksgiving spread and serve lasagna or stuffed shells as your main course. Do whatever you want. Our current notions about Thanksgiving have been shaped by someone else's ideals for long enough. It's time to start creating your own rituals and traditions that reflect your own values and preferences, not someone else's right? Doesn't that make sense? So I encourage you to just create your own rituals. Do whatever you want to do. I've been trying to reinstate a tradition that I grew up with, but it hasn't worked yet. When I was growing up and celebrating the holidays with all my cousins, all the kids would go into the TV room while the adults like drank and smoked and played cards upstairs. And we would watch, I don't know if you know this movie, we, we watched Mighty Joe Young and King Kong, the original King Kong. And I have no idea why these movies played on Thanksgiving every year, but every year on Thanksgiving, like some TV channel would play these films. And of course they both have to do with the ethical consequences of exploiting animals for human gain. I don't think it was a coincidence that I really loved these films, but I haven't been able to convince anyone to watch them on Thanksgiving at my own house. Maybe I'll try again this year. Or so see, I'm trying to create, recreate my traditions or just, you know, but you know, anyway, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. No guarantees. Don't write to me if it doesn't work. As far as the side dishes, uh, the options are truly endless, like endless. Here's an example of what's on our table every year. We got mashed potatoes, mushroom gravy, and we always have a chunky and a smooth version of the mushroom the mushroom gravy, bread stuffing, cranberry relish, corn, mashed rutabagas, some kind of sweet potato dish, sauteed green beans, roasted Brussels sprouts, cornbread or biscuits, and green salad. And I know I'm missing some things. It's a feast. And it's really awesome because most of our friends really do enjoy cooking. So even if it's mashed potatoes every year, one year it will be mashed potatoes with caramelized onions. Another year it's mashed potatoes with roasted garlic. So even though it's a little different every year, it's still, it's still familiar. 
Speaking of familiar, I, I want to make it clear that, yes, there might be a few things that are new for some people, but that's the case whenever you're learning to cook any new cuisine or new dish, right? I mean, what's the point of being alive if we just close ourselves off from anything new? So let's not look at it as a negative thing to have to learn about some new ingredients. This will basically keep your menu familiar, but just with a few tweaks, it can also be vegan. So obviously when making mashed potatoes, we use earth balance instead of dairy-based butter. When I make my mashed potatoes, I actually don't prepare them with the earth balance. I usually just whip them up with some non-dairy milk, or you can also use a non-dairy creamer. I'll get to that in, in a second. Um, or I use the water that the potatoes were cooked in or, st or steamed in, but I don't usually put the, the non-dairy butter in while I'm whipping them. That would just create a lot more fat. I obviously top the potatoes with some earth balance. And there are other non-dairy butters or spectrum and there's other kinds of margarines, but Earth Balance is really the best. If you haven't tried it, please try it. It's just really fantastic, and you would never know the difference. No one would ever know the difference between between this and dairy butter. When making such things as bread stuffing, obviously I use vegetable broth or, or vegetable stock instead of the stuff that comes from a turkey. I mean, switching from animal-based broth or stock to vegetable-based broth or stock is a no-brainer. Look for a good broth or a veggie bouillon cube in your natural food store or obviously make your own. And make sure when you're looking at the ingredients for the bouillon cube that you can recognize all the ingredients. That's, um, I think, something that's really important. You, you don't want there to be 10 ingredients on something you're eating, especially if you can't recognize most of them. What else? Uh, I already said using non-dairy milk instead of cow's milk, but you can use the non-dairy creamer. Wildwood has a soy-based creamer. Uh, you know, for your potatoes or whatever you want. It's just a thicker soy milk is all it is. And I believe that Wildwood makes the soy creamer that Trader Joe's now sells as their house brand. So you can you can find that there at Trader Joe's. Um, and obviously this is the kind of creamer that you use for coffee. Not that I've ever had a cup of coffee in my life, but I've heard that people drink coffee. So I thought I would throw that out there. You can use the soy creamer instead of a dairy-based creamer or half and half or whatever else people are putting in their coffee. Gravy, the same thing. I make the the best mushroom gravy this side of the Mississippi. In fact, I probably make the best mushroom gravy that side of the Mississippi too. And it's just so simple. It's in one of the, the, I think one or two of the Thanksgiving packets and it's just mushrooms and onions and garlic, a little flour or any kind of thickener, a cornstarch is the thickener, uh, a little tamari and a vegetable broth. And you can make it chunky or creamy. It's really, really delicious. And I don't know, I can't think of anything else that's typically animal based. All the side dishes can be just roasted or cooked with plant oils. Um, so it's just a matter of using those. And Obviously, all of this is not just better for the animals. If you haven't figured it out, this is all much healthier for the humans, too, because you're not getting the animal protein, which is problematic. You're not getting the saturated fat, which is problematic. You're not getting the cholesterol. Obviously, you're not getting lactose, and there's no risk of salmonella and other foodborne illnesses. So it's just a win-win situation. So let me just tell you about some of the menus that are in my Thanksgiving recipe packets, just to give you an idea of more side dishes. And of course, if you'd like to purchase any of these packets, you can do so by visiting the the website by visiting compassionatecooks.com and you go to recipes and under recipes there's packets for Thanksgiving. Um, there are $5 for five and six recipes. Some, some packets have five, some packets have six recipes. So you can obviously go to the website and get those. So Thanksgiving for the birds one is harvest stuffed acorn squash, mashed potatoes with caramelized onions, seasonal stuffing with toasted nuts, glazed garlic, green beans, and pumpkin pie with pecans. Thanksgiving for the birds two, squash stuffed with curried apricot pilaf, spicy pumpkin soup, autumn tempeh medley, applesauce, and rice pudding. Thanksgiving for the birds three is butternut squash risotto with sage, which is amazing. It's really delicious. You can do the same thing with the risotto and serve it in little pumpkins. Um, holiday cranberry relish, French onion pie, mushrooms with rosemary, garlic, and port, and pumpkin spice bread. There's Thanksgiving for the birds four, which is butternut squash and rice timbales. And I told you about them already. And then I also put sauteed kale underneath them. So basically I serve the timbales on a bed of sauteed kale. 
There's also roasted Brussels sprouts with apples and onions, mashed Yukon gold and sweet potatoes, golden mushroom gravy, pumpkin cheesecake with pecan crust, and there's also a recipe for hot mulled cider. Thanksgiving for the Birds 5 will be basically the recipe packet from my upcoming cooking class, and I'll get those recipes up as soon as possible. Basically, that's the squash, fennel, and apple soup, uh, harvest stuffed phyllo triangles with mushroom sauce, uh, mashed root vegetables with fresh herbs, rosemary drop biscuits and German apple cake. And there are also related packets in the holiday baking and cooking section of the recipe part of my site. Some packets are for dinner, like I like this kind of thing, like the elegant crepes with Moroccan flavored seasonal veggies, toasted quinoa salad with slivered almonds, shiitake mushroom and walnut pate, which is amazing. Roasted beets with orange vinaigrette and pecan balls or the Russian tea cakes for dessert. That's holiday cooking and baking three. But there's other holiday packets that are kind of more for appetizers and finger foods. You got the Mediterranean red lentil pate, tabbouleh, hijiki and olive tapenade, baked apples and mint chocolate chip cookies. Now you can see obviously that in each of these packets there are desserts and of course there's there's no dearth of desserts when you embrace a compassionate lifestyle. I don't mind giving a shameless plug for my cookbook at this point, The Joy of Vegan Baking, because obviously in that book you can find over 150 recipes for baked goods, and they're not all sweet. They're not just desserts. This is called Joy of Vegan Baking, um, and you'll find whole wheat bread, Irish soda bread, brown bread, drop biscuits, corn bread, and a slew of other baked goods that could accompany your dinner. And then as far as desserts, you'll find recipes for pumpkin pie and pumpkin spice bread, bread pudding, chocolate bread pudding, you can probably figure out what my favorite is. Baked apples, butterscotch pudding, fall fruit crisp, apple pie, apple cobbler, lemon bars, and a ton of other recipes appropriate for the fall and winter holidays. And there are even beverage recipes in the cookbook. There are mold cider recipes and wasal and holiday nog, chai tea, and it goes on and on. So check out joyofveganbaking.com or just call your local bookstore to order it directly through them. You can even get some non-dairy ice cream to top your pies and obviously go to your natural food store for that. And you can even get a non-dairy whipped cream. Um, there's a new one out that's kind of like in the ready whip can canisters. And you can look for that in, in natural food stores. Or you can go to a store like Vegan Essentials, veganessentials.com, and order it there. It's made by Soya2, S-O-Y. A T O O. And we just had some for my husband's birthday party and it was really yummy. So you can check that out too. And also I have some vegetarian Thanksgiving related children's books in my Amazon store. So if you go to compassionatecooks.com and you click on stock your pantry, you can go to recommended reading and then there's a subcategory called, um, I don't know, there's something, holiday books for children. There's also stories about pigs, and you'll see, under recommended reading. One book in particular is called Twas the Night Before Thanksgiving, and it's very sweet. It's a vegetarian-related book story. And there's another one called Sometimes It's Turkey and Sometimes It's Feathers. Well, the story is called Sometimes It's Turkey, Sometimes It's Feathers, which a student of mine gave me as a gift. She had read this book to her children. So it's very special to her. It's been around for many years and now it's very special to me. So I put that one up there as well. So you could see some vegetarian specific Thanksgiving uh, stories. Now, I don't want to shock you but you should know that I do have turkey on my table every Thanksgiving. After I set the table all purdy like I put photos of rescued turkeys on the table so they have a place of honor on the table because, you know, they're alive and living in a sanctuary somewhere. And it's a time to honor and remember their sisters who were not so lucky, who are not so lucky in other people's homes. And it's a tradition I started many years ago. And I love taking pictures of our Thanksgiving table and sending these photos to family members and friends who are not vegetarian to show them that you can experience the abundance of the harvest and the true spirit of the holiday without creating harm. Isn't it amazing? You can carry out traditions while still honoring your values. Despite what some people think or, or, or some notions that people have, they're not mutually exclusive. One thing I know for sure is that whatever meaning we attribute to this holiday, that meaning is not lost. In fact, it's enhanced by creating food-based rituals that affirm rather than take life, that demonstrate compassion and empathy rather than selfishness and gluttony that celebrate the fact that no one need be sacrificed in order that we should eat. I find it very offensive when people say that they pay respect to the 
dead animal by praying over her corpse. They say they thank the animal for sacrificing herself for us. And I think it's just such an insult. It, it reflects a fantasy we want to hold on to, to absolve ourselves from any responsibility in that animal's death. To utter prayers of thanks over the mutilated body of an animal who struggled to live but who was destined to die from the moment she was born is a mockery of that animal's life and it's a mockery of that animal's death. We have no nutritional requirement for the flesh of an animal and unlike billions of animals on this planet, we can make choices about how we want to live. We can even make choices about how we want to die. They can't. In every moment, in every single moment, we have the opportunity to reflect our truth. If our truth, if our ethics dictate that we perpetuate the suffering of other beings on a scale of immense proportions, then we're doing just fine. We're doing just that. But I don't think that's what we really want. I don't think that's who we really are. To participate in violence against animals just because we can, just because we always have, is to forget who we are. And I don't know anything more painful or traumatic than not knowing who we are or what we believe in. On behalf of those who have no voice, on behalf of those who have no choice, this is Colleen with Compassionate Cooks. Thanks for listening. 